We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Welcome into Tailgate. Austin Gale here and Mike Renner and Seth Galina in sunny Cincinnati, ready to rip it up and light it up. Uh, Seth, great to have you, man. You are staying an extra couple days here after the draft because we need you. I, I can't. They won't let me go back home. <laughs> because uh, of all your bad draft takes? Uh, the, the <laughs> Mount, yeah, all of my bad. They, the Mounties found all my bad draft takes and they won't let me back in Canada. I think that's fair. Not even for the CFL draft? Isn't that happening? Like, I think it happened yesterday, or if did I'm not it mistaken. Happen? Well, let me go look that up real quick. You guys continue, but I'm going to look up CFL draft. We're really excited to have you on, Tailgate. We've had you on this podcast before. The famed he can't play quote on <laughs> Herbert was said on Very this podcast. Very interestingly, because I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the first times we met you, too. We just buried you in a body bag. I had worked at the company you. for maybe a week and a half yeah. when that happened. Yeah, that's right. I uh, still don't forgive you personally. Like, per you personally. Um, this is really just, I'm putting on a brave face here being on this podcast. Again. Well, we I'm go. excited to get some more. Jesse Lucetta, second rounder. In the CFL draft. He's he from did, Ottawa. Did he yeah, get also drafted in the NFL draft, though? Yeah. Yeah. Um, seventh round. Tyrell Richards from Syracuse, number one overall pick. Yeah. Wow. Well, you take you take guys you take with guys the from, idea that even if they're drafted in the NFL, well, first of all, there aren't many that are going to be drafted in the NFL, but you take them anyways just in case because at least you have your rights to, you, the, the rights to them. But isn't that just burning a second-round pick if he chooses the NFL? It, it doesn't matter. It's the CFL. I've always like, had the just, take, it though, <laughs> that the CFL – has one of the most egregiously nationalistic rules of any organization yeah. I've ever the, the seen. The quota. If they have a quota that it has to be that many Canadians. If America had that for like the MLB, could you imagine the backlash? Of Wait, I didn't know that. The yeah. roster has to be 50% Americans. People would lose their shit. Well, what, they what should because then the best is... product wouldn't be on the field. Yeah, I mean, that, well. if it was 50% but... <laughs> Americans in base, at Major League Baseball, it wouldn't be the best league. Yeah, and the thing is the CFL is not competing to be the best league, right? They're they're trying to be a Canadian league. They're trying uh, to be a homegrown type of yeah. league. So what ends up happening with the They're trying to be like a local coffee shop. Yes. Yes. Essentially of Canada. Yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to be a dick. I, I, that's kind of like what the That's model literally is. what it is. John Mechie was a seventh rounder. That's fucked. Yeah. Seventh but again, round. it's like he was drafted later in the CFL but than he's he was in. From Canada. Well, yeah. I, they're he drafting, him, they're drafting him on the prayer that he that's ends up why, not working like, out. With Lucetta, you're thinking there's a chance that he plays in the CFL. With Mechie, you're, 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 he's not going to play in the CFL. He's oh, too good. Oh, that's why he goes Wide later. receiver one. Yeah. Okay, interesting. That's an yeah. interesting draft strategy. There could be a really good podcast on the CFL draft strategy. Well, I draft John Mechie second, but it's really unlikely ever plays for my goddamn team. So maybe I only burn a seventh, and then if he gets cut because of his ACL, I can bring him in. Massive, the CFL. massive audience for that too. For oh, that podcast. It sounds like we're turning this podcast into the CFL podcast. Yeah. More people watch are watching this podcast live than live in like Saskatoon. So. <laughs> <laughs> You're also illegally streaming Man City versus Real Madrid. Yeah, if we get excited during the show. So uh, it has nothing to do with you guys. <laughs> Who are you rooting for? Uh, I'm a Manchester United fan. Therefore, I'm anti-Manchester City. So Real Madrid. Lovely. Yeah, yeah. you'd love to see it. All right, let's get into the show. The reason I wanted you on this show and why I wore, well, LSU. <laughs> the reason you wanted me on this show. I texted <laughs> don't, you. Don't, don't. They don't. The listeners don't know this. I texted you two hours ago <laughs> being like, let me on your fucking podcast. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, sure. Sounds good. So the reason I wanted you on the show specifically, though, so I want more off the cuff takes. So we're going to do the mailbag. Oh, okay. It's just going to be off cool. the cuff, off okay. the cuff. Yeah. And I bet you we're going to get some gold. This is a non prep mailbag. Who can play? Who can't play? All right. <laughs> this is from Mike moaning during trivia on Apple Podcasts. Mm, I don't moan during trivia. You just moaned just now. Okay. I don't know if I, I brought this up live before on a, any type of PFS show. Mike is a big trivia guy. I he learned is a that, huge uh, trivia guy. Last year. Big Biggest. trivia guy. He Thanks. stopped inviting me because I was getting them all right before him. That's not, <laughs> well, that's not true at all. Uh, this is from Mike Moaning during trivia. Maybe it's someone who knows you for doing trivia. Which older prospect are you more confident that his game will translate to the NFL? Devontae Wyatt or Devin Lloyd? Man, 
don't make me choose. I, I think they're both. I, like I, I think both games translate really well. I, I think I'd feel more confident about a defensive tackle just based off of the history of the position and seeing like, you know, scheme is so important to the linebacker position, success and failure at the next level that obviously a guy can look drastically different depending on where, what he's asked to do with the linebacker position, whereas defensive tackle is pretty, pretty limited in the range of things you're asked to do. So I'd say Devontae Wyatt, but again, they're both pretty, they're both pretty safe. Yeah, I mean, I like, I like both those prospects a lot. I'm curious about Wyatt being that old, and I didn't see like a ton of different variety in his pass rush moves and stuff like that. So you just wonder if like maybe, maybe that's who he is already. Yeah. And I mean, look, that's who he is already. The kid's like 24 years old. It's not like he's 30, he's not like he's my age. Um, How old are you again? It's your birthday. It was my birthday yesterday. Oh, it's his birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, Seth. Thank you. Happy birthday. Um, yeah, so that, I guess that's what I wonder about. Like, at, already at that ad, advanced age, quote unquote, like, are, do, are those the moves that you have already? Um, that would be concerning. Um, a, maybe a little more, but I agree with Mike. I mean, like, the scheme thing is interesting with the, with Lloyd. I'm actually very interested to see what they do if they're going to bring that Tampa Bay three four. Like Mike Caldwell, the defensive corner, going to bring that Tampa Bay three four to the Jaguars. Are they going to play with more four down? I don't know. Um, but yeah, I'll say I'll say why, but I think I'm more more lean to Mike's uh, non answer. I lean Lloyd. I lean Lloyd. Honestly, I think Lloyd's going to have a lot of success in Jacksonville. Devontae Wyatt though was I think everyone talked about Jermaine Johnson at the Senior Bowl. Oh man, he was the most dominant there. Devontae Wyatt was up there, right? I mean, he was ruining kids. I thought he showed more in that pass rush acumen at the Senior Bowl than because he, he was did. allowed to, right? You're right, able exactly. To pin your ears yeah. back and all that stuff. All right. Yeah. Uh, the last part of that comment also said Austin needs to either shave his mustache or lose the glasses. I can't see out of my right eye. So I guess it would be a contacts decision. All right, this is from Foster. Should have won hashtag robbed. The Ohio State receiver duo reminds me a little bit of the LSU wide receiver duo Uh coming out. One comparison I really like is Garrett Wilson to OBJ. In the draft guide, the comparison used for Wilson was Deontay Johnson. What are some differences between Beckham and Wilson coming out that make you lean more Johnson for the comparison? Love the show. Also, my fellow Mastergators, stop the mic hate. Oh. We get a lot you. of like, thank you, so we'll do Foster. speak pipes sometime. Have you heard our podcast? You don't listen to it. No, of course so the not. speak pipes are where <laughs> listeners are allowed to leave voicemails. Okay. And so many times we'll get like a voicemail and it'll be like, hey guys, uh, my name's Jerry. I want to, you know, ask a question about X, Y, and Z. And they'll finish like, Mike stinks. Like, it's, like, <laughs> it's a weird, it's a weird uh, energy, but uh, go ahead and answer the question. Seth feels like the one to answer about LSU guys coming out. He's an LSU fan. Yeah. I will say I wasn't doing like draft stuff back then. Same, I mean, I'm still kind of not thing. doing draft was, stuff yeah. any, right now, but like. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me that. <laughs> but I, what, let, let, let me think about it. Uh, OBJ and and Jarvis Landry those two guys I mean it's tough to remember back then but obviously Jarvis has become this like underneath um, slot type of quick guy I think he might have played outside a bit more um, given given that LSU was playing with like two fullbacks on the field every play I, I assume he played more outside back in those days and yeah I mean I could see some comparisons to Garrett Wilson playing outside having that like uh, sudden start stop ability that OBJ had. So yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I'm into it. Let's do it. I think everyone for player comparisons, right, just wants to comp players they really like to really good players. Mm-hmm. And that's you know OBJ coming out of LSU was awesome. So with Garrett Wilson, I think everyone was looking for dynamic, smaller receiver that is phenomenal at the release point. I think Odell Beckham Jr. was exactly that. Yeah. I like the Deontay Johnson comparison. Landry is nothing like. Olave though, no, like, yeah, that's that, the I don't problem. see the one to one there. Yeah, so well, it wasn't Landry. What did Landry run coming out? Four, like, four seven, seven. seven. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. So All right, you, just, you forget how fast. If you, even when you watch the film, you forget how fast Olave is because it's like he's he's a smooth route runner, and he doesn't like he doesn't have that like burst. Um, that's like quick five yard burst that you see a lot of receivers. Obviously, Gary Wilson might be in that category. Mm-hmm. So I, it was always hard for me those type of guys. Sh- uh, Killer Shakur is like that. Jahan Dotson is like that where you don't realize that they're like insanely fast and insanely well certainly Olave is insanely fast always hard to evaluate for me at least because you don't see like the suddenness yes right yeah this is from Ara Zabayan how confident are you that Benito can become an every down edge one day in the NFL if not should you still value him as a great designated pass rusher so I I think he could be but as just like your you know open end guy in a defense weak side end whatever you want to call it like you really don't want to having to kick in head up over a tight end over a tackle anything like that but if you give him space i think he can play the run that's why i say like the open end where you're not really where you're really either setting an edge or you have that space to freedom to 
go either way on a tackle. He can do that for sure, but he's just not going to be versatile in, in that regard. So. Well, I think we talked about him specifically on the on the draft episode when he got drafted, just being like a guy who his plays against the run, just to, to continue what you're saying, just his plays against the run are just like, oh, I'm going to set outside and then I'm going to knife in and, and make a play in the backfield. So there's a spot for that. Like you said, it, it can't be a guy who kicks in like we've seen – you know, like the top two picks, right? So Trayvon Walker can do it. Aiden Hutchinson can do it. He's obviously not like that. Yeah. But I think he has – he showed enough moves for me, even against the run, that I think he could be a really good player. I think he's got a really nice speed rip out on the outside and just enough of that inside move that if the run game if, – if he can just gain a little bit more power, mm-hmm. a little more pop against a base, base block, then I think he'll be good. Because I think he can keep himself, like, clean. He's not a guy who just – you really worry about getting ripped off the line. Like they're just really just getting moved and doing, being a complete non-factor. Like anything you'd be a factor, but you're just going to take a little up and down play from a guy like that. Do you think his frame is relatively maxed out? I know there is some understanding or some thought sometimes with guys that are small. It's like, oh, once you get to the NFL, they're going to be blowing you up and you're going to be able to add some weight. Devontae Smith is definitely not one of those guys. Sometimes your frame can be maxed out. I don't think he adds 10, 15 pounds in Denver. Yeah, he's probably 250 and under his entire career. But he's 248 is what he came in to combine that's fine there's dozens of guys across the nfl playing at that right now next question is from chad daybell please bear with me with the premise and long-windedness of this question i was thinking about the edge class top five guys hutchinson thibodeau walker jermaine johnson and george Karloftis. comparing them to the top five qbs in the 2018 class chad daybell was just like digging here dude this is wild what parallels do you see your confidence level their college production physical traits upside and overall as ross prospects i came up with aiden equals baker thibodeau equals lamar walker equals josh allen Karloftis equals josh rosen and jermaine johnson equals darnold what do you guys think do you agree or disagree with my with list and what's your list? Does he also talk to like his wife about it? Because I feel like this is a situation where you're making just an insane comparable, Chad, that this is tough to see how you even saw this coming. But I, I like it. I will say with said, <laughs> with said premise, I don't think you could do too much better than what his were. I liked it. I like his a good. lot. Yeah. With the premise, that's how it's going to go. I do think so. But now the premise is – I would like to know where the premise came from. Yeah, you know, like what was the inspiration of the comparable? I, but I like it. I, mean, I think the one I hate the most. Let's highlight the one we hate okay. the most. I hate the Karl Loftus Rosen one say. the most. That one doesn't really yeah. align. I get the Thibodeau Lamar, and you understand the Walker Allen. I don't need, the Johnson Darnold one even because Johnson is not like with Darnold. It was coming out like, oh, this guy has like high. all this untapped potential, yeah. and he's an athlete, and he creates all this torque in his throws, and it's so nice. And like Johnson is like. He's like more polished, but he's maybe yeah. not the athlete. He's a little stiff, so I don't know. Yeah, Something- like Johnson would be like your Mac Jones coming out. Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. And so Karloftis would be quarterback prospect in recent years. Let me think of a good one. Hmm. Who would Karloftis be like? Come on, we can do this. No idea. Justin maybe. Fields? Mm, yeah, no. kinda, I, I don't hate Fields. I, don't hate I Fields. can kind of see it. Okay. Bailey Zappi? All right. <laughs> I have I have Ohio State takes. I know we're I know. Just go. Bear with me. Just light it up. Well, so I'm I'm finally watching. I mean, I watched Stroud. him a lot throughout the season, but I'm finally watching uh, C.J. Stroud um, for the College Football Preview magazine that everyone can go and find. Um, July 5th, I believe, is coming out. Yep. I I loved Fields coming out, but now watching Stroud, I'm like, am I? I was I too high on Fields? <laughs> I'm serious, and I like because I like both of them, and I like I, yeah. I would still put them both. Um, you know, as Strata, I still think is a top five pick. But I look at that offense, and I'm like, man, they're they're creating explosive plays. Now the quarterback's got to fit some balls into tight windows down the field, but at the same time, like there's no there's no quick games. I don't even a lot of RPOs. I mean, they are just firing that thing in the seams, attacking safeties at a level that no one else in the country is doing. And you do see, like, I'm like, all right, is the offense a little, uh, a little college-y, a little too college-y? I don't it's know. definitely mm-hmm. college Yeah. I, I think that it also helps that they have really good receivers. Like, you cannot – we just talked about Gary Wilson and Chris Olave. You know, one of the issues – and one of the reasons why Michigan did so well against them uh, this past season was 
you can't press those receivers on the outside. They're too good, but they're also too good when you give them off coverage of they're running those like 18-yard, 12-yard, 14-yard speed outs, and the quarterback, far hash, can get the ball there on the yeah. sideline all the time. We saw it from Fields tape. We've seen it in C.J. Stroud's tape. What Michigan was able to do was press them and then not allow over-the-top yardage. Um, you know, when you get pressed, you're going to go down the field. So it's just like – you're playing against Nebraska or something. The teams are in a defense are in a no win situation. You just can't handle that that level of talent on the outside. I will say, Fields. You see the videos of him. His new release. He's got the tighter yes. release now. I'm intrigued. You're a big release guy. How do you look at? How you like it? I saw the same video. It was a really yeah. cool um, way to like like isolate his his, um, his actual arm angle. Yeah, I think the thing with Fields last year that that I think was interesting was. Him and Trevor Lawrence have a very similar release. The difference was that Lawrence, it was just quicker. It was the same arm path-ish. It was just that Lawrence was so much quicker. So we saw it and we got excited about it. Honestly, honestly, not in a different way than Olave versus Garrett Wilson. where We can get more excited. I think they're both really good receivers. But we can get more excited about Garrett Wilson because the sudden starts there's the quickness the burst the foot fire the foot fire right um so that's that's like the same thing so I I think Fields had a uh, the release speed is more my issue rather than the elbow Mm -hmm. but if the elbow gets better that's great too something Mike and I have been doing on this podcast Mike is not as big of a fan of it as me is trying to give the YouTube chat that follows along live a prompt and yesterday we saved it for the end of the show and I got at least 15 DMs even though at the end of the show there's listeners at the top with names for a strip club daycare combination someone sent me tits or tots which I think is good and someone said the playground which I think clears the bar in so many ways it's versatile all that today i'd like the youtube chat who's following along live and you guys to think as we continue to go through this mailbag a strip club gym combination strip club gym combination don't give me your answers now we'll continue to pour through the mailbag here this is from xoxo gutter all scream xox strip club week PFF. insert complimentary copy pasta are there any players mm. in this year's draft who might be best served with a position change? I know you've talked about this a lot on mm. the draft with Daxton Hill maybe playing outside corner, Trent McDuffie in Kansas City maybe playing the Tyron Matthew role. He says here, I don't mean corner to safety or off the tackle to center, but linebacker to tight end or running oh. back to kicker. Oh. Running back to kicker, no. So like, there's no <laughs> one I'm suggesting that for. We, 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 haven't, we haven't looked at them as kickers. We don't know who can kick. True. Talk about devaluing the running back position here at PFF. We're asking to play kicker next. Troy Anderson is a name that came up. So the, the Falcons GM, after they drafted him, the line, uh, linebacker out of Montana State, he said he's such a hybrid player. I think someone mentioned like Taysom Hill on defense or something. I, I think he could do a lot of different things, right? He's, he's such a wildly athletic player. He played running back, quarterback, and linebacker at Montana State. That's a name that comes up in terms mm-hmm. of making a significant transition. But even some of those minor transitions, I think, are fun to speak to. Daxon Hill playing outside corner, maybe. McDuffie playing inside. That Matthew role in Kansas City. Are there other names that come up there? I, I like I, – I floated Jelani Woods to tackle, offensive tackle. Did you float that? As an option. Thin. For tackle. Yeah, but You'd I'm saying like – add some weight, but I don't mind weight, it. But like, I don't mind it. He, he's like plays around 265. He doesn't have to add that much weight. And like he will be athletic as hell even with 35 more pounds on him. So Jelani Woods tackle was like a blocking tight end prior to being a real tight end. You have anything there? That was one I really liked. I got <laughs> if he doesn't, you know, if he doesn't work out, got tried it. It was four days ago. So it's definitely not just Joe Douglas on Apple Podcasts asks, "What is the time frame for the Jets front office and coaching staff if they finish with a record similar to the past season? Do you think it should move? They should move on from the current staff? How, how well, from a PFF grade standpoint, does Zach Wilson need to play to keep the staff around? Does a seven win season with a seventy to seventy five grade keep Zach Wilson? I'm sure they're factoring in grades to the, whether or not they move on from him, but keep keep everything on track. Where do you think this line needs to be crossed? My my opinion there is that if Zach there has been a lot of conversation from people who do report on the Jets that the reason the Jets did not spend astronomically in free agency is because they're still thinking about the long-term future with Zach Wilson, and they still need to see that step from him before, you know, drafting well is one thing, right? They, they, they did trade back up for Jermaine Johnson, but it wasn't all that significant. They traded a fifth rounder to go get Brees Hall. Those aren't short-term, wholesale short-term decisions. Signing a bunch of monsters in free agency to big, hefty contracts would be a bet on Zach Wilson improving more so than um, you know drafting as well as they did. So I do think there's still some concern around Zach Wilson taking this step. My opinion is if Zach Wilson doesn't take this step, I think Salah and Douglas 
get another swing at the quarterback position. I don't think they move on from Wilson. I think they could move on from Wilson after a second, third season, but I think Douglas and Sala are there to stay a little bit longer. No, I agree 100%. I heard the same things about their free agency planning was around them not being quite so sure on Zach Wilson. And I think that they've done – it's so funny because, like, it's – it is partly like we're we're in the media. I mean, no one listens to me, but like, if we say that the GM and coach are doing a good job and it's the quarterback's fault or the opposite, like that that literally like people read the media, like yeah. the owners and stuff. They read they they know um, they they look at this stuff, and that's I think what we're all saying here in the media, quote unquote, is like, hey, they've done a good job, but if the quarterback doesn't doesn't do well, that's not on them. Well, that, that and it also does impact fan perception to you know what the media is saying about it now maybe not to a massive degree but it still does to a degree what we go on maybe not us but like other people obviously in the new york area what they're saying about the staff and whatnot so i i do think i do agree like it's there's no bar for zach wilson to clear for the staff truthfully it's going to be how the other pieces look it's like how is the offensive line plan how, how is this defense going in you know year two of robert sala like plan there so that to me is bigger if Zach Wilson looks exactly the same as he did as a rookie obviously probably not gonna take a mess gonna take some steps forward at least but if he does if he doesn't show any market improvement I think they would look elsewhere as a quarterback next offseason I don't think it reflects poorly on staff or sort of the GM because it's one of those picks where there was no debate you know like people weren't there, there was hardly it wasn't a controversial yeah, they didn't stick their neck out number there. two overall pick exactly it wasn't like Going Trayvon Walker over Aiden Hutchins, shall we say. So, The name for the strip club gym that I like most, I came up with this myself, YouTube chat's been kind of dormant here, is Squat Racks. <laughs> That's not bad. That's not bad. This is Kevin King is Trash on Apple Podcasts. Would you guys agree that pure athletic testing does not measure a player's ceiling? Instead, it measures this, what separates players who are already productive. If you agree, then wouldn't you take someone like Drake Jackson over Trayvon Walker? Both have size and length coupled with elite athletic testing numbers. However, Jackson is by far the better edge defender right now and only 20 years old. And he put has put on crazy weight while still testing elite. Yeah. I, yeah. I just like I, – I still don't really understand the the – the Chavon Walker going one, I, I, I really don't understand it. I, I hope it works out for him. I hope first, he's a good player, but I, I just don't. Still the don't first line it. that question is interesting. Would you guys agree that pure athletic testing does not measure player ceiling? Because I think right now, if you had to ask 100 people who tuned, tuned into any pre-draft coverage, would say the guys who test the best athletically have the highest ceiling. Right? It, that would yeah. be on average, right? And I think there is more conversation to like what creates – for a ceiling is it purely measurables and athletic testing because there's arguments to that it's not the, that's not the case yeah i've been railing against that concept for a long time now of just pure athleticism translating to ceiling because we've seen sort of examples of it not being the case at numerous positions throughout nfl history you know oh, drew Brees. Fuck. drew Brees's arm is not elite by any means but obviously it was one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time um Richard Sherman ran four five six. Casey Hayward ran four five nine. Like there are guys, every every position you look, there's an athletic outlier who would turn into an elite player at said position. Now, it's kind of a more often than not elite players are elite athletes. But just I've railed against the concept up. Just because Trayvon Walker has more elite tools does not mean he can get better as a player than an Aiden Hutchinson who has elite tools in his own right. So like it's you're haggling once you enter the tier, you're haggling between. Uh, guys in that tier of elite athleticism that doesn't necessarily make you make one ceiling higher just because they possess this. Yeah, I mean, I don't combine test. I don't know if this answers the question. Better. I don't think this, I'm saying anything crazy here, but like we just don't ha- we don't have a good way to measure, you know, being broad here, but processing. Not to, you know we talk about it with quarterbacks all the time, but it exists with every player in every sport in any position. Like we just don't have a good way of processing that, and I think like and coordination, co- yeah, exactly. And like things that don't, don't get have... talked about. Like you never hear someone mention the guy's yeah. coordination, but it's a real thing. It's a, like, it's a real thing. Yeah. Um, someone I, I was talking to, not to bring up Justin Herbert again, but I was talking to someone who uh, who's been around Herbert, and he was like, he's he's uh, has like a photographic memory. Like you don't know this, and I think, and I, I actually think that's why Herbert went six in the draft because obviously the tape wasn't great at Oregon, but you get him in the room, and you can decipher these things um, better, not to a full degree, but better. Um, whether it's you know the memory thing, remember it's hand-eye coordination and mm-hmm. stuff like that. 
And the other thing is just what the combine tests are. It is a sprint. It is two different types of jumps. And it is two different types of like lateral agility drills that are like supposed to be comprehensive, but in no way, shape or form. That's a good point. Near comprehensive yeah. enough. For not what even, not even weight adjusted field. athletic testing is right. comprehensive enough, yeah. right? I mean, they're some of the best athletes. That, and, that, and it's also, I think, wrongly, wrongly billed as the more athletic you are, the higher your ceiling is, right? It's like once you enter, enter this elite tier of measurables or weight adjusted athletic testing, then it's like that's, yeah, you're going to have not necessarily a higher ceiling, but you're, you're going to have less excuses, right? Less excuses to not perform. I don't even, I think that's what it's more like, right? It's like, okay, short arms, you have to go come, you know, make up for, right? Not having big arm, you have to make up for, like there's these different traits that you have to make up for in the league. Being really athletic and, and having really good measurables for your positions, eliminate excuses. I think where we need to get better is identifying what other things outside of yeah. measurable inflicted or athletic testing inflicted do that. So the next thing is, and I, I saw a tweet by Patrick Mahomes' quarterback coach. I think, I think his name is Bobby Stroop, if I'm not mistaken. So, one of, so one of the things that he um, Jackson. that he does is instead of just being like, okay, this is a straight line, 40-yard dash, there's a lot of like, I'm going to say a cool word here. There's a lot of curvilinear motions. Oh. And this is the type of thing that we are getting it into getting at in football coaching and different and coaching in different sports where it's like they will he'll race against a guy trying to catch him running like a zigzag type of pattern like an s type of pattern because that is more you know you're so rarely like running in a straight line for 40 yards right this doesn't happen mm -hmm. you're more in that and i've seen other uh, clips not b by bobby stroop and some other guys um coaching football where and i've done this drill with my with with my players where you put a towel on someone and you're just playing tag with the towel and that is really how you see if someone is athletic like because now you're you're not just it not just running straight forward um in a very confined environment you are trying to do something you are trying you're there's a skill involved in in taking the flag um while people are moving in unpredictable ways and that is how you find athleticism um not in a straight line not yeah. in the l cone that there's a lot of technique to the l cone yes. all that you're stuff. practicing that stuff and it doesn't change it, the, the l cone does not change when you're practicing it at your gym to, to Indianapolis. This conversation has gotten really interesting, but it's not all that dissimilar to like standardized testing, right? Yes, like st exactly. St standardized yeah. testing is supposedly like testing IQ and like the one, like all that stuff, or even in school, like an SAT score is like, this guy's smarter than this guy. It's like, no, like that's not how it works. People were preparing for the test. If you read the SAT prep book for a week, you're gonna grade a lot better. And that doesn't matter how smart you are, how dumb you are. That's just like legitimately impactful. The same with these guys who like literally quit doing anything football related for three months just to try and run in a straight line and run a three cone better. So it's it's an interesting conversation. A couple updates here from the YouTube chat. Some terrible names. <laughs> Strip Club Gym. Oh no, it says to the max. That's not great. Big racks, I think, is I've loading. Big someone said strip club gym. Like, <laughs> yeah. no, that's that's the exercise. I like that. Big racks, I think, is solid. Yeah. Rack them up. Someone said personal breast. I don't even know how that makes sense. <laughs> and like, someone said spotters. I had that one in my head. But spotters, I think, is good. That's good, yeah. Spotters is not terrible. What about, like, peak performance? I hate it. Peak performance. <laughs> try harder. Peak? Um, try harder. That one's, that one's solid. This, <laughs> you don't, this is from Ty's. Do, do, I have a question for you, too. But you know what? No, I shouldn't ask you that. I shouldn't ask you Yeah, you have to. Fuck. We're live on YouTube. <laughs> I was, I, don't say anything negative. Okay, don't say anything negative because I don't want to reveal too much about you, you yeah. two personally. How has the podcast, just be positive, please, just in case. Well, how has the podcast changed since you guys have moved in with each other? Do, do the people know that you guys live together? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not much, truthfully. Really? I barely see Austin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm usually just in my room chilling. We, we hung out last night. We hung out last night, yeah. played some Halo, which was lit. i so bad at Halo. So bad at video games. I was pretty bad last night. Yeah, this is from Ty6987. Love the pod and discussions you guys have. How's the chain transformation going? Not well. Also, what are some storylines you guys are most... the chain's been working for you lately. It's been, it's that's a nice. good... That's probably your best chain fit. Yeah. What's up? That's, yeah, that's a good chain fit. I might do the chain when get I get the home. Chain. I, I've been thinking about it. So my thing is... I've been telling a lot of friends this. My thing is I want to do... I want to do the cross dangly earring. Okay, well, not that. That's, he, he lost this, dude. He yeah. lost Ooh, the Ooh, someone audience, just said so. the sweat pit. <laughs> no one is going to that strip club if it's called the sweat pit. <laughs> oh, God. Don't get the dangly earring. Yeah. You guys shut that down very that quickly. Was... Well, as we should. 
That was a step too far. That was like two steps past. Can we finish this guy's question? Yeah. Unless you're ready to talk about it. Okay. So. What are some storylines you guys are most excited to see play out in regards to the 2023 class? Who has a chance to raise slash lower their stock this upcoming college football season? It's obvious. It has to be the quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. There's so many like really talented quarterbacks in this class. And after a quarterback class that literally the NFL just took a shit on and hated, letting quarterbacks fall as far as they did, there's going to be a lot of teams hoping Devin Leary pans out of NC State or Tanner McKee takes a step at Stanford. CJ Stroud and Bryce Young. He doesn't even take a step. He's the first round. Stop. CJ Stroud and Bryce Young maintain like this number one, number two overall mm -hmm. stuff. People want Will Levis. People want Tyler Van Dyke, DJ Uangalele to figure it out. Spencer Rattler, who was a projected number one overall pick. There's so many quarterbacks <laughs> in this up here in class where there's some hype building, and I bet you there are a lot of teams who are literally on their hands and knees praying that these guys actually live up to the billing that I think is going to be such a big conversation in 2023. All aboard that train, the quarterback train. I guess for me, playing off that is like, where does Will Anderson fall, fill into, fall into this? Because he might be like, just the, no matter which quarterback takes a step, even if Bryce Young wins another Heisman, like he still might be. Like, do you still do you take Will Anderson as like the number one overall pick? Um, because he's just that good. You just can't pass on a generational type of player like that. I don't know. My most interesting, well, obviously quarterback's probably the most interesting just generally, but a close number two for me is this running back class is about to be insanely good. Like, maybe better than 2017 when we had Fournette, McCaffrey, um, both go in the top ten. So the debate around who's going to go in the first round, because B. John Robinson from Texas, I'll tell you right now, he's going to go in the first round next year. You have Tank Bigsby from Auburn. Devin and Chain mm -hmm. from Texas A&M was going to run the four twos. Dwayne McBride from UAB, who I, whose tape I absolutely love. Sean Tucker from Syracuse. Like, there's a ton of talent in next year's class that will be in that borderline first round range that the, the PFF forecast might have an aneurysm on it. <laughs> they, they might, they might. They might f literally fold. I, I think I heard, I heard the PFF forecast said they're really high on B. John Robinson. And <laughs> they think he could get a premium. Well, that's why they're mad about Brees Hall. They said wait till next year's <laughs> running back class. That's why. You cut that off my punchline. Oh, was, sorry. It was, was it? such a good joke, too. It what wasn't was it? that good, but I still think it could have been heard. What was it? I said I think the forecast guys are high on B. John. They could get a premium UDFA deal. But now it's terrible saying it. Second time. All right. Uh, milk Crate on I'm YouTube. I'm glad I interrupted that. The milk, crate, <laughs> the milk Crate on YouTube. Curls and girls, I don't really like that. Then someone, Joey two I times. I actually don't mind I think that. This is the you're winner. good, milk crate. You're good. Joey two times. This is the best one. Okay. Barbells, but bell spelled B-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's hot. That's, that's very well done. Very well done. Uh, next question from Scary Lamb. I feel like last year everyone has been talking about Denver as one of the best rosters in the NFL, and they just need a QB. What exactly about their roster is so great? Is it the amount of good players on the teams on friendly slash rookie deals? Is it depth at certain positions or a lack of overall weaknesses? I think it was where they're good at, you know, wide receiver, cornerback, two positions that, you know, the passing game that they should be able to impact. And obviously they couldn't maximize this great receiving core because Drew Locke, but they still had very good pass defense. So I think that's why a lot of people are high on them because those pieces there are kind of like, what championship teams, those are the pieces that that looks like. But they just missed the one position that also championship teams look like, which is quarterback position. So I think that's why. I well, still like them. I was on the Chris Collinsworth podcast yesterday, and I said, if I had to bet a team that isn't the Raiders in the AFC West to finish last in that division, I think it's Denver. And it's not because it's not a talented roster. I have concerns with a lot of the newness, yes. right? It's new head coach, new quarterback. That is a lot. Right, and then you have to have a healthy Cortland Sutton who didn't play a lot last year. Jerry Judy has been good, but he's getting a new quarterback. No Judy slander. No Judy slander. I'm not slandering okay. Judy. I'm right. just saying that a lot has to go right quickly in a division that is insane yeah. to, to go well. And you could argue the same things for the Raiders, but the Raiders are the favorite to finish last in that yeah. division. Okay, I'm not, I'm not saying anything crazy saying the Raiders can be last place next year. I just don't think betting Denver to win it next year – I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I, I think Denver, while Russell Wilson's great, Hackett, you could argue, is an upgrade. Losing Vic Fangio on defense isn't going to help, right? That's not going to help this defense. I don't know. I, I worry a little bit about Denver and some of the hype that's being built around Russell Wilson, Hackett, et cetera. You know, I mean, I always say this about Russell Wilson, that, that he could fall off a cliff any time. Like, that play style tells you that it could happen. You hope it doesn't, and I, I, I hope it does. I'm not a fan of the Broncos, but I hope it doesn't because I like watching Russell Wilson play. But, like, if it falls off, it's over. Are you hinting at, we've brought up that tweet about Russell Wilson on this podcast before. 
from that guy who said he thinks in a couple <laughs> years. <laughs> oh no, that he's gonna have a debilitating. Are you saying what I am saying? Is that just through my tape analysis, <laughs> Russell Wilson probably has Parkinson's disease? <laughs> there is a tweet if you're a new listener to the podcast from someone says that they hope he hoped he's a Seattle guy. He hopes that Russell Wilson gets traded before his Parkinson sets in because he thinks he has Parkinson. It's an absurd tweet. I don't know what to do yeah. about it. I don't know what to do about it. All right, uh, next question. He, I think that I think the thing is that he compared Russell Wilson on the field to Lou Gehrig. Oh. Therefore, he also has Lou Gehrig's disease. That, that was it. It was. I thought I had tweeted it before, but I can't find it tonight. But for a few years now, I had this feeling that Russell would become the football Lou Gehrig, which is to say he would be an iron horse for many, many years, and his career would be cut short by something like ALS or Parkinson's. Why does he feel that way? Why? I don't understand how that's an dude, actual you gotta take. So trust your gut, dude. Football yeah. guys trust their gut, and that's his gut. I think right. next year on the draft show, you should add in Who? a potential debilitating yes. illnesses. <laughs> Who's most likely? Well, there I was, do a, the there was a scout. Every year, most likely to, <laughs> to there was a ALS. guy who's like a former NFL scout that does like TikToks who said Derek Stingley Jr. is a risk. Oh my or, god! It was something like Derek. That was a guy we roasted for a while, and he said the red flag was that his grandpa was paralyzed in one of his YouTube videos. It that was, was a insane. red flag. There was some insane shit out there on the internet. <laughs> that was <laughs> the former NFL, the Jets guy that we we, yeah. oh, we did oh, one of his uh, mock draft. It's not the the guy who thinks that Tim Tebow is like the greatest quarterback of all time. Probably. No. All right, we, let's get oh, off okay. this. Loser. <laughs> Dude, from, the, he said that Derek Stingley's grandpa getting paralyzed was a red flag. That's History incredible. of paralyzation. That's worse than that. That's worse than <laughs> that. <laughs> All right, this is from Geyer on Apple Podcasts. What do you guys think of a potential Justin Jefferson contract will look like, knowing that AJ Brown's at twenty five mil and it's nearing thirty? And then what's Dalvin Cook's trade value right now? A fourth? This guy thinks so. I don't know. I think a team would trade a third at least for Dalvin Cook. At least, maybe contract a with that. Yeah, I don't I, know. Probably a third. Yeah, I think it's a second or third for Dalvin Cook. But yeah, I mean, Justin Jefferson's going to reset the wide receiver yeah. market. So we say, I mean, he's yeah. going to get more than 25 mil a year that AJ Brown got Tyreek got 30 a year. If he doesn't come in above 30 a year, I'd be surprised. I agree. I agree. This is from Mendoza QM. Do you think the Panthers should look to trade Robbie Anderson or Terrace Marshall for a second or third rounder, or maybe try and get a haul for DJ Moore? I think we've answered this question before. I think we did actually get that exact question. Just didn't get deleted, no, but we're not answering it. they I'm should saying. maybe Seth's take on it. I don't care about the Panthers. Okay. Fair. Panthers fans hate this pod. <laughs> this is from 13R Weaver. How would the NFL value an elite all-around athlete at the punter slash kicker positions? Obviously, if they were elite, they would probably play a different position. So let's say we have a Tyreek Hill that can kick. Do you think the NFL is readily, ready to utilize that skill set? At high school teams aren't ready to utilize that skill set. So the NFL is definitely not ready for that. Well, I will say Zach Daasi, the long snapper for the New York Giants, was a former linebacker that then also long snapped, was not a good long snapper by any like measure of long snappers, but they kept him around because he was by far the most athletic long snapper in the NFL and like could actually tackle, could actually make an impact as a tackler on special teams. So if there's gonna be any position where you could forego acumen for athletic ability, long snapping is the one that I think you'll see teams be willing to do so far. I feel like there are enough you know, I made it the high school comment. I feel like at the high school level, you have enough good athletes who play quarterback and then can kick because I don't know, they played soccer or they're just good kickers slash punters and never use. And that would be the time to use your because like your quarterback who's like a good kicker uh, slash punter is probably just as good as your high school kicker slash punter. Yeah. So you can use them in creative ways on fourth down and stuff like that. Um, you know, third down pun, I guess. Um, but uh, you never, you just never see it. You know, all of, yeah. I've been around it enough to, to know that, I think. From Nicholas C underscore three, every position group in this draft is in a giant fight. Last one standing wins. Who's winning in each position group? He has Malik Willis, Damian Pierce, Drake London, Jelani Woods, Trevor Penning, Cole Strange, Luke Fortner, Kyrie Elam, Kyle Hamilton, Leo Chanel, Jordan Davis, Aiden Hutchinson. Maybe we go start with quarterback. I don't hate the Willis idea. Six foot, 220. Yeah, hard know. to go against him. Matt Corral? I don't know. Well, see, I mean, he's got nothing to lose, right? I <laughs> he got his last Stop. On the... <laughs> I mean, Corral already didn't – didn't he beat up, like, Wayne Gretzky's son? Oh, did he? You if that's true, this? then I'm going Corral. Yeah, it's Corral. Running back. Who's the biggest running back in this class? I don't know. Brian Robinson is probably, like, the 
with the wait, wait, wait for us, Xander, Xander Horvath. Oh, Horvath. Oh, he's like yeah. a fullback type. That was the, oh, that guy uh, Purdue guy. Nice lunch. Yeah. He's like not it. bad. Let's go Xander. Okay, wide receiver, though. No one's beating George Pickens, dude. That guy is oh, crazy. Not even obvious. close. Do you see the video of George Pickens? Can we it's, put the video of George Pickens we'll, we'll getting drafted? Next week. I know exactly what that you're talking about. That thing was fucking incredible, dude. He's insane. He's he looked insane. out of his fucking mind. He, he, he looked, it, it didn't look like, it just looked crazy. Like, yeah. it looked like a crazed person. That's exactly what you want in this, yep. in this exercise here. <laughs> Tight end, I feel like it's kind of obvious. It's Coquifed. Yeah, Coquifed. Yeah, because the issue with John Woods is too tall. Yeah. Low center of gravity. Yeah. Trevor Penning's probably right. He almost killed Desmond Ritter. So I feel like there's an opportunity for Trevor Penning to be the biggest winner in a tackle fight. I mean, here. Icky, though. Daniel Falele, though? Icky. Yeah. Are you being Dan- is too well, hot. Is cut him, he cut fast him down, enough dude. to, like, or we're talking about like in, a, in an down. MMA type of, like, situation where you're in a ring with someone? Yeah. I'd, I think Falele is too slow. Okay. I'm not, I'd, I'd lean Icky, dude. That guy's. Yeah, Icky's not bad. Does he have the nastiness, dude. though? Yeah, he's got He's <laughs> just a scary dude. All right, interior off the line. Cole Strange is what he had. Any other guards you think would be like, some kids? Well, I don't know if guard or tackle, but Darren Kennard. Oh, Darren yeah. Kennard. He's got 11 inch hands. That yeah. guy's throwing oh, baseball yeah. pits. Yeah. Um, Kyrie good. Elam at corner? I don't know. I'm trying to think. Corner. You need a bigger corner, though. Sauce, I kind of like. The, the cool Zion speedo. McCollum, big kid. Oh, Tariq oh. Woolen, maybe. He's a big dude. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Cam Taylor Britt's pretty physically imposing guy. Pretty. Pretty Safety, Cal Hamilton. No. Who? Lewisine. Oh, Lewisine. I like that. I'm close. Okay. Lewisine will, Lewisine will, like, take your head off. Like, on the football field, and I think he would do the same thing. Uh, Linebacker's got to be Leo Chanel. That, you I like that Leo right. Chanel. Yeah, that's fine. Jordan Davis. DT, DT. Jordan Davis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, fine. Edge? Edge, though. That one. Fight. Trayvon Walker? Trayvon Walker's got, like, prototypical, like, boxer skills. Mm. Dude, yeah, those long arms. But this is more just fight to the death. Oh, it's death now. Right? <laughs> Last one standing. Fight to the drop. Um, I like Walker. Hard to go against Walker, but. Let's do Walker. All right. Very. Oh. This is from Mom0918. My question is, how old do you think Keen Slovis will do? Kenny Pickett did amazing this past year in the pit system, so how old do you think Slovis will do? Thanks. Well, this is a pit fan down bad. He's lost Jordan Addison, so not great. But I, I think he'll – He's not going to be like Kenny Pickett, but I think he'll succeed there. I think he'll have a good season, but Jordan, losing Jordan Addison sucks. Like, that's just a punch in the nuts, honestly. Like, that guy was by far and away the best receiver Pitts had since Jonathan Baldwin. And TBD on where he ends up. From Howie Mandela. Do you all ever experience imposter syndrome? Your rise has been, dare I say, cliche, meteoric. And it seems like uh, j- bumping shoulders on GMFB with all these big names would be intimidating, or maybe you're just sociopaths with no fear. I think everyone in this industry has imposter, imposter oh. syndrome. <laughs> Everyone's just a sociopath. No, I think there's definitely some imposter syndrome sometimes, for sure. I, I don't really feel it truthfully but sure. more get so over, get over yourself more so it was so okay i will say but it but it was like um when i went on the, sh- the bachelor like going on that i was definitely like out of body i'm like this is fucking not real like this is absurd but so since then i've, I've i haven't really felt it truthfully. Well, it's you, just man. my whole it's just it's that weird. How you feel ever like? since i did the pff 2022 NFL draft show with former bachelorette contestant Mike Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just feel no it's just it's just I'm so calm now. Yeah, yeah of course I get I get sometimes it's like that. It is um, a weird feeling. But here's the thing about me though, I am bad at this. <laughs> yeah, right? I know that. Yeah, I know that's, that. That's, that's, thanks. This is from the Cole. <laughs> What do you think would be a necessary football? What would you think would be necessary for a football league like the USFL to be able to stay afloat? And do you think it will ever happen? Can I start? No. Yeah. USFL or any league that's trying to compete for not with the NFL, throw the NFL out the fucking window. That's one swear word. If you're trying to c- compete for airtime and watchability with college football and the NFL and all the other sports that exist, you need to do something significantly different in how you broadcast the game and how you market the game and who plays in it. Like, period. I'd rather see you, every team has to have one dad on it. 
and like it's and it's a what? guy. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm saying like you need to like it's not as simple as like we're just gonna take all the players that the NFL doesn't take. That's stupid. That's like you're never going to win that way. So she went from there to a team has to have I'm a saying, father I'm, on no, their team. I'm saying not a father necessarily, but like you, you can pick like random people or something. It just has to have a oh like an average mar- Joe. Yes. What's okay. the market factor for USFL? Huh. It's like the NFL, but all the players are worse. Like, I don't get yeah. it. Like, I don't get it. I, th- I thought the XFL was trying to do some stuff, especially with the betting stuff. They had the Pat McAfee stuff. on the football field. Yeah. They, did, they did the fan engagement. There was some stuff there. Yeah. There was some brief. I haven't watched the, the, this USFL this season. I'm, hopefully this weekend I get a chance. But, like, I haven't heard anything where they're doing it besides, like, micing up the players. Yeah. That, but that, which is not who enough. Cares? Who not cares? Enough. If it's not a G League for the NFL, which the NFL doesn't want that, and college football does not want that, and those people have enough more money than God to block that, the USFL needs to do something wholesale different that makes it watchable. And it's not, I guess, guess what? It's not hiring retread coaches yep. and retread players in the NFL. Yeah, and Kevin players, Kelly should be the head coach. Why are you putting him. Fisher in there? You don't need those guys. You yep. need like, hey, we just brought in this sophomore at Montana State High School and he's going to coach this team randomly. Like you need to do something yeah. absurd. Well, <laughs> to me, to me, there were two paths to success for a USFL or some other league to actually become a viable yearly watchable experiment. One was to steal college players, which is not happening anymore with NIL. Yeah. They, that, that ship has sailed because yeah. they're making more in college than they ever would in the USFL. Two is to get NFL affiliations. So if you're watching a team, this is the affiliated, you know, this is Has the Packers team. Be. This is the, that, Colts the NFL never do team. that though. I'm just saying that that's the only way to viable because you can't garner. I'm watching these guys thinking, what are they going to be for my favorite NFL team? Is the probably the only reason you watch it because it is an objectively inferior product. I mean, it's not the only reason, but like if you're really going to get league wide interest, you're really going to get a big chunk of NFL fans. It's going to be with the affiliation of those players can be on my team here soon. I just think that's impossible to happen. I just don't think that's ever going to happen. So I think you have to lean into the bit a little bit, like the XFL did by like they were showing, you know, Pat McAfee like literally in the. I don't think it's impossible for the NFL to sponsor a you team. You think? I mean, maybe not the USFL, but I don't think it's ridiculous that yeah, they're they in time could be the NFL's affiliation, like as a feeder program. Maybe you're right. Maybe I mean, they right. had NFL Europe for a while, which was that concept. I do think the NFL is waiting for one thing, to, for one of them to be viable, to make it past yes. one freaking year, and then, um, you know, a few years down the road, saying, "Okay, this is viable. We can get our we can get our hands in here." And, and that was the business plan of the AAF to begin with, was basically just to prove viability and then try to get the NFL. Influx. Then, don't you think if the NFL was even remotely interested in that? say it, the USFL does last year, second year, whatever. Don't they think they'll drop the eligibility rules of like staying three years in college or whatever, or like, or what would to like let people go into the USFL? I don't know. Cause I, right now the NFL has a really nice G league and they pay $0 yeah. for it. And it's called college football. Yeah. And it's a very watchable product. More people watch Mississippi state's home opener than yeah. they've watched any Reds game this year. But like it's, it's a very, it's a very, it's already good and they pay nothing for it. But it's more about, and I think this will come with also maybe expansion of the NFL if that ever, if they ever broach that topic, which will come. I mean, it, it does. Every league keeps growing, getting bigger, and the more money that comes in, the more they're going to look into it. But the limited practice time, the fact that guys in the bottom of the roster really aren't getting reps, aren't developing, coaches and GMs and front offices are going to clamor for the ability to have those guys get reps somewhere, I, and that I, would be a, a secondary league. I so. think we have to pause this because we're all making these takes on what the NFL should do. Empower 1969 and YouTube has hit the nail on the head in that the NFL weakness is that it's garbage officiating and it needs to go back to how they play defenses in 1970s, decriminalize the offense, you know, and, and yeah. I'm with criminalize the offense. Yeah, yeah. Criminalize the offense. And he wants to see people dead, which I, I mean, we can get back to that. Maybe uh, uh, Quinn has the George Pickens video up. If we want to run it, run the George Pickens video. It's electric. <laughs> Him wearing the <laughs> under helmet, whatever that's called. Serpent. I don't know. In front of his TV. I don't speak on this. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Can we also get a picture of like Ernie McCracken from Kingpin up here with Austin side by side? What's hair. Ernie McCracken? Look up Ernie McCracken. Oh, Bill no. Murray's is character from rough? Kingpin. Oh. Just look up Bill Murray's character from Kingpin. Okay. Um, this is from Will Clank. 
We need Papa Gale on the pod. Yeah, we're well, not going to happen anytime soon. With the large <laughs> amount of <laughs> receiver talent coming out of the draft recently and guys like Chase and Jefferson being instant Pro Bowl players, do you see this continuing with young receivers making big-time impacts immediately? Also, on top of that, could the market become oversaturated and prices for these receivers go down due in large part to the talent pool? Or is it just important, too important to have stars with to win Super Bowls? I agree about the trend of receivers making an impact early. Now, Chase and Jefferson were special prospects. They're not every year. You're not going to get that. But I do think that there is just like, you know, there will be more 1,000-yard rookie receivers than there ever were in the past because guys are playing and getting reps from ages 13 through college, high, high-end reps, you know, like – really being involved in passing offenses that are now translating to the NFL. So it's, it's not, it's going to be far more common in the coming years. You took the words right from under my wings. Um, I don't think that's the expression. It isn't. Uh, that's what it is. There's just, I mean, you go to, they're playing, you know, I, I talk about like with, you know, as someone who's like been around quarterbacks for a long time and I'm always like, yeah, you know, some people are like, oh yeah, this quarter, private quarterback coach are taking over the world, and most of them suck, and blah blah blah. But I'm just like, all right, yeah, m- maybe they do suck, but I'll take a quarterback getting reps 20, 12 months a year mm-hmm. while playing other sports. I, I get that, but getting those reps 12 months a year, and I think it's the same with receivers playing seven on seven. It's like, yeah, seven on seven, quote unquote, real football. No, but they're getting cl- reps that are very close to real football. Um, at least from a micro perspective, from an individual perspective, you're getting that 12 months a year, 10 months a year, more than they ever had. And then they're going to their high school teams and they're throwing the football more than ever. With this, and this is why I'm like, I think obviously receiver is a premium position. With that said, I don't know about, man, like I don't know about taking receivers that high unless they're Jamar Chase. I mean, obviously we don't know that they're going to be Jamar Chase, but that's, that's my concern, I think, going forward. Yeah, I do think the run this year. That's it. <laughs> you're not going to see. You're not necessarily going to see the the ROI early on like we did last year. I just don't think it's even class close. But I do think that people are realizing you just have to have dudes. You have to have dudes at wide receiver. And also the other thing is I think with the proliferation of passing at lower levels, athletes, better athletes, are choosing to play wide receiver, whereas in the past they might have chosen to play running back. They might have chosen to play other positions because wide receivers are getting featured now, whereas maybe 15 years ago you're a high-end wide receiver in a high school offense that might get three targets a game, and you're just going to want to touch the ball more. we got two more things before we got to jump. Forecast is jumping in here with George Chahuri and Eric Eager. Um, do you have the Ernie thing queued up, Mike? Jesus Christ. That's not me. Is it? Maybe it is, actually. <laughs> you got the lo- Dude, look I kind of like that, actually. Oh, this hair is kind of popping. Uh, <laughs> the other thing is the last question for the mailbag. I really appreciate you joining the show, Seth. Uh, you are a fantastic analyst and one of my best friends. This is from, <laughs> De- this is from Grant Almeida. Austin tells, me, he, Austin tells me this like every time we see each other, and I just haven't responded so there's ever. One time, <laughs> there was one time where we were bevved up a little bit, and I was like, you know, you remind me a lot of one of my really good friends from college. And he was like, one of my best friends we don't talk anymore, but like, it's great to have a friend like you. And he's like, cool. <laughs> and then I went home. And then you guys went, then yeah, I was like, I'm absurd. going home. All right, this is from Grant Almeida to close out the podcast and my sorrows. How good does a Canadian high school football player playing in Canada have to be relative to an American high schooler in order to be recruited to a top American high school? Obviously, in recent memory, Bama recruited two highly skilled Toronto kids, wide receiver John Mechie and D. Lyman, Isaiah Hastings. You're obviously so. It's really, it's really the issue is not even position players anymore, or anyone but quarterback. That's that is really the issue is quarterback. Um, the issue is that none of them are good. No, the issue is that I don't think that they rate quarterback film from Canada, where you can they'll still rate because again we, we go back to this the same thing that we talk about all the time. Oh my God, um, is that we can always project athletic ability. So you can go on the tape and see John Mechie is like a crazy athlete and then, well, he'll, he'll work somewhere, right? Yeah. So that, that, that- oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that barrier has been broken down. It's the quarterback um, that, you know, there was a, there was a, there was a um, amazing quarterback out of Montreal this past year who just didn't get the looks in the States because they saw the tape and they said, well, you know what I mean? That's not enough for us because you're playing, you know, in a Canadian league. And not even if there's a quarterback with like crazy arm talent or super athletic in Canada. Those well, guys aren't even getting looks too. Michael O'Connor, Penn State, uh, the the O'Rourke brothers, uh, Ohio, Jack Zergotis from Montreal, UConn. Like they're they're there. It's just like it's it's t- that's the toughest one. But I I think we've broken down the barrier for the other positions. Do they play Canadian rules in high school. Uh, BC, like where Vancouver is, they do 
they play American. Okay. Some places, the rest of Canada is uh, is Canadian. Gotcha. Well, this has been a fantastic show. Really appreciate the time, Seth, and I wish you the best and safe travels to Canada. Thank you. Uh, until next time, Austin Gale, Mike Renner, Seth Lena, Tailgate.